Good morning, everyone. Hey, I wanted to let you know about a, a change we're making uh, with our youth program. Studies today show that 70% of teenagers graduating from high school from their churches don't return to the church. And uh, what determines if uh, uh, youth re uh, stay with the church after they you know, graduate from high school or from college? Uh, there, there are a number of things, but three things in particular. One is being part of the worship service. Many, uh, many uh, you know, parents today will say, you know, I was in church when I was a kid, but my kids aren't, and now they're not in the church anymore. Uh, and so uh, Chris uh, Quinn has, uh, is, is planning on the youth staying in the services with us on the second and fourth Sunday. So next Sunday uh, they'll be with us. And uh, so we're going to do everything we can to make our services engaging for our, uh, our youth. Um, second thing that helps a youth stay with the church uh, post-graduation is to get involved serving somewhere in the church where they actually maybe are working side by side with somebody not their age. Uh, and so we're going to be working to see that maybe more youth help with our children's program, Kids Space, maybe with the food that we have after uh, meals, and then maybe here in the worship service in some way. The third thing uh, that's important to keeping youth in the church is uh, developing relationships with people in the church. Um, uh, Christian Smith says, for a young person to make it today as a follower of Christ, they need eight adult Christian relationships. Now, if that student's fortunate, they might have a mom and dad. That'd be two. If they go to a church like this, they might have Chris and Lindsey Quinn. That might be four. Maybe they develop a relationship with another uh, leader in the uh, youth program. That might be five. Where did the other three come from? Probably the rest of the church body. So I just want to, you know, let you know that next Sunday the youth will be here for the service and I want you to be looking for them and, you know, when we have a little greeting time, introduce yourself uh, and, then, and then when we have food afterwards to try to get in a conversation uh, with, with a middle schooler or a high schooler. Uh, kind of a big win would be if uh, you actually developed a relationship with one of our young people. You know, you found out that, you know, they're interested in the vocation that you work in or uh, they're in the same sport you were in when you were in high school, I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, where you might find that you're, you find yourself talking to the same kid week after week. So, just wanted to let you know of these, uh, these changes. There's a lot of anger in our country. You see it in our political discourse, demonstrations, uh, in the workplace, in the schools. Uh, moms, uh, dads, one of the most important things you can teach your son or daughter is to uh, how to deal with anger issues and reconcile when they have a broken relationship with someone. All of us need to learn how to do this. I know couples who are fighting with each other and they don't know how to get right. I know people that have been at war with their neighbors for years. Uh, I see uh, teenagers and grown adults who are walking time bombs because they've allowed bitterness to, to grow up within them. Uh, there are people that are actually literally physically sick today because of unresolved anger issues or people who have, have flipped out mentally due to inability to deal with anger. You say, well, okay, I know I've got anger issues, but I don't think you know the person I'm dealing with. I don't see any chance of ever getting right with that person. And I've been angry with them so long, I don't see myself changing. Well, you actually can change. I'll give you three examples of changes that have occurred in our generation. Recycling. Years ago, everybody threw paper and plastic and glass and tin cans in with the garbage. Now everybody recycles. Sunscreen. I remember as a boy uh, putting on dark tanning oil. We'd try to get as dark as we could, as fast as possible. We'd get burned over and over again. Today, a kid can hardly go to their mailbox without their parents slathering them with the highest SPF on the market. Seatbelts. 
I remember as a boy going on family vacations, my dad would put down the, 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 the back seat in our station wagon. My sister and I would, would lay in the back playing cards or other games. I mean, today, kids are in car seats almost till their first middle school dance. <laughs> you can change. You can change the way you deal with anger and broken relationships. Jesus, in fact, tells us Dealing with anger and reconciling must be done right away. Maybe you're not a believer. Somebody who claimed to be a believer did something against you and you vowed, I will never have anything to do with Christian faith. The reason that happened probably is because that person was not putting into practice what Jesus teaches about broken relationships. Maybe you've come to the place today where you need to hear what Jesus has to say. And you need to put it into practice in your life. So we're going to read Matthew 5, 21 to 26. Would you stand in honor of God's word? This is Jesus. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, that means you're, you're no good, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Lord Jesus, you tell us it's very important to deal with uh, anger issues and broken relationships, and so we see the need in our lives. So show us how to do this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus suggests seven steps to dealing with our anger and reconciling with people. I have found the principles Jesus teaches here always work. The first step, confess your sin to God. Uh, the place to begin when you've lost your temper with somebody or hurt somebody, or bitter towards someone who hurts you, is to confess it to God. Unless we confess to God that we've done something, it's highly unlikely we'll ever go to somebody else and ask their forgiveness. So the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day, they sought to limit the application of the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, to the deed of murder itself. So as long as they hadn't you know, committed homicide, shed blood, they thought they were good to go. But Jesus says the application is much wider. It includes our words and our thoughts. Um, angry thoughts may not lead to murder, but they're on the same path uh, to get rid of somebody that we're angry with. So, if we're going to deal with our anger issues and broken relationships, first we must admit to God that we have a problem. On Halloween night, 1990, a boy, a 10-year-old boy named Ike, was getting ready to go trick-or-treating with his older brothers. His mother, Ida, said, Nah, you're too young. And he went into an uncontrollable rage. He went out and started smacking his fist against the tree in, the, in their front yard until he was all bloody. And uh, his dad sent him to his room, and an hour later, he was still crying in his pillow when uh, his mother, uh, Ida, came in. Ida Eisenhower was the family oracle. She said things like, God deals the cards, but you have to play them. And that night, she quoted to him Proverbs 16, 32, uh, he, the one who controls their temper is greater than the one who takes a city. And Ike Eisenhower, when he was 76 years old and he was kind of reviewing his life, he said, you know, that was a turning point in my life. 
Well, he went on to be president of the United States for two terms, but his greatest contribution to the United States and the world was leading uh, the Allied forces in uh, the attempt to liberate France and defeat Germany. It began on, at Normandy, June 6, 1944. But before he could lead the Allied forces, he had to learn to control his own temper. Uh, he ranked only 125 out of 164 in self-control in his uh, graduating class at West Point. His mother, Ida, said that of all her children, he had the greatest problem with dealing with temper. So before he could become a great leader in the world, he had to control his own uh, spirit. He admitted he had a problem. God says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So first we confess our sin to God. But if we want to get right with somebody else, we must do more. The second step to reconciliation is make friends quickly with your brother or enemy. Jesus uses two analogies to make his point. The first has to do with the person offering their gift at the altar in church. He says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Now, you would think when somebody brings a gift to church that uh, the gift would be accepted under any circumstances. But Jesus says, no. If there are unresolved anger issues and broken relationships, the gift is not acceptable. The second example is a person going to court with an accuser. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. In both cases, Jesus' counsel is the same. Dealing with anger and reconciling must be done right away. Yet how often do we fail to apply what Jesus teaches here. We'd rather get hot and bothered and hang on to our anger and grow in bitterness. But Jesus says, if you don't make friends quickly, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. One of the verses the writers of our journal uh, led us to this week was the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Paul says, if you hang on to anger against someone, you're giving the devil a shot at you. Another verse they sent us to is Paul in Romans 12. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Kyle Eidelman is the pastor of Eastern Christian Church in Louisville. It's the fifth largest church in the United States. And he wrote a book uh, this year called Grace is Greater. And he, he started by uh, asking all his Facebook friends to send him a story of uh, a time when somebody wounded them. And one lady uh, uh, wrote him uh, that after uh, she and her husband had married 13 years, uh, their husband was relocated to Baltimore, Maryland. So they uprooted, they left friends, they left family, uh, left her career, left their church to a place where they didn't know anybody. And when they got there, she found over the, uh, the, 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 the opening weeks that her husband was kind of cold and indifferent toward her. And she learned that he had uh, an addiction to pornography. She confronted him about it and he just kind of flipped her off like it's no big deal. It was kind of like it's your problem, not mine. And she learned later that that's actually a symptom of somebody who's a sex addict to pornography. So they went to counseling. They went to a, a marriage retreat, but her husband's heart was hard. Six months later, he uh, left her and filed for divorce. And so she's saying, God, I left my family and friends and church, and I'm in a place where I don't know anybody, and now my husband's left me. 
And she felt like God responded to her, you know, I understand. And she felt God prompted her, don't just pray for your marriage to be reconciled, but pray for your husband. He's actually not just leaving you, he's leaving God. And so she began to pray for his salvation, his commitment to Christ. A few months into their separation, she found something else that he had done where he had lied to her and betrayed her. So she called him up to confront him. And she found herself, rather than confronting him, just forgiving him. They're still not back together again. She doesn't know if they ever will be. But she says, I got rid of my bitterness and anger and I learned to forgive him. If she hadn't, that bitterness would have eaten her alive. So it's wise to deal with our anger and forgive people. Now this cuts two ways. Jesus means first, if you've wronged someone, you need to move quickly to make it right. But it also means if someone's wronged you, that you don't allow bitterness to fester within you, but to forgive that person. If you don't, you're headed for big problems. Bitterness will sap all your energy. It's said that when Leonardo da Vinci uh, painted his great Last Supper, he painted uh, the face of one of his enemies on the shoulders of Judas. And um, uh, then when he came to, 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 to paint Christ, all inspiration left him. It was only when he forgave his enemy and painted out the insult that he had inspiration for the painting of Christ. When someone has wronged you and you refuse to forgive, you're basically saying this offense is too big for the cross of Christ. We must reconcile quickly, but what do we say when we try to reconcile with someone? This leads to step three. You say, I am sorry. You, with genuine remorse, say, I'm sorry. But saying I'm sorry is not enough, so that leads to step four. Say, I was wrong. Uh, this one is tough. The toughest part of reconciling for me is to admit when I've done something wrong. This is hard because we're all taught not to do this. You know, we're taught to rationalize. I wasn't myself when I did that. Uh, everyone is doing it. That's like saying, you know, it's no big deal. Everybody else is doing it. Or people weren't fair with me. That's like saying, you know, I'm justified in what I'm, I've done. But we'll never know reconciliation unless we admit we're wrong. Now, there's a cheap substitute. It involves adding two letters. The word if. If I was wrong, I want you to know I'm sorry. But when you say that, that ruins the whole deal. You're really not admitting anything. You're saying, you know... Uh, I don't think I was wrong, but obviously you do. You've got the problem, not me. Since you're so thin-skinned and insensitive, uh, I'll say I'm sorry, I'm wrong. But unless we admit we're wrong, we won't get reconciled. The fifth step is a question. Will you forgive me? You have to actually ask the question, otherwise you don't give the person a chance to respond and say that they do forgive you. The flip side of asking forgiveness is to remember that when someone asks us to forgive them, we need to be quick to forgive, not to hang on uh, to our anger. Apostle Paul says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and com compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ, God forgave you. Now, you might be sitting here this morning and you're got your you know jaw clenched and you're gritting your teeth and you're saying you know it's all nice to talk about releasing anger and forgiving people but you don't know what you're talking about you have no idea what this person did to me well you're right i don't know your situation but i know somebody that was probably wronged more than you were. In Acts chapter 7, a guy named Stephen, this is after Jesus had risen from the dead, he was preaching in Jerusalem about Jesus' resurrection, and the religious leaders were so angry, they took him out to stone him to death. 
At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. So what would you do if someone was throwing rocks at you to kill you? While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep, which is a euphemism for he died. It sounds just like Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus said when he was dying on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. There's a sixth step. You say, I will try to never do it again. Another uh, verse the writers of the journal led us to this week was Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. A true confession involves repentance, a, a plan to try to never do it again. Without that, your confession is hollow. Uh, this came uh, home to me a couple weeks ago. I came to Jory about something I had done, and I said, hey, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, would you forgive me? And she said, nope. And I was like, shocked, what? She says, you're just going to do it again. Well, she's got a good point. If I haven't made a plan to actually change, then I really haven't done anything. It's of little use to ask forgiveness unless you have a plan to change the way you live. Now, one final step. Make restitution if possible. A guy named Zacchaeus in Luke 19 uh, said to Jesus, if I, well, anybody I've wronged, I will pay back fourfold. Um, confession without restitution when it's appropriate is empty. Uh, suppose... Uh, you uh, drove to church today in your brand new Mercedes-Benz GLS SUV. It's all shined up and you carefully park it against a curb. And after the service, I get in my 2006 Mazda 6. It's a, it's a nice car, but, you know, face it, it's 12 years old. I'm not so concerned about it as I was 10 years ago. And I pull out kind of quick and I ram into your car. So I get out and look at it, and the paint's all scraped off, and the door's dented in, and I've smashed one of your headlights. And you walk up, and I say, boy, I am sure sorry for hitting your car. That was pretty careless of me, but, you know, I've prayed and asked God to forgive me, so we're cool. <laughs> Have a good day. I mean, that just won't cut it. Jesus taught <clears throat> that dealing with anger and reconciling must be done right away. Now, I'd like you to do a relational audit. Is there someone with whom you have a broken relationship? A husband? A wife? A son? A daughter? An ex who makes your life miserable? A mom who constantly yells at you? A dad who uh, seems oblivious to your existence? A brother? A sister? A boss? A school classmate? A co-worker? A friend who betrayed you? A neighbor who makes living in your neighborhood a nightmare? Someone that destroyed your family? Frank and Elizabeth Morris's 18-year-old son, Ted, was home for a Christmas break from college, and he got a job for making extra money. His mom was worried one night because he hadn't come home from work, and then she got the call that every parent dreads. Someone was coming in the opposite way and straight over into his line and hit him head on. Tommy Pigagi was the driver in the other car. He went to a party and he got drunk. His friends told him not to drive, but he didn't listen. He blacked out. He didn't even see Ted's car coming. Ted died the next morning. And so Frank and Elizabeth went to the trial and they were enraged that Pagagi pled innocent. And the, the trial, you know, had lots of delays. And so it was nearly two years before it was resolved. And Tommy was let out on probation. 
Well, Elizabeth began to have, uh, you know, nightmares, and she began to dream of, you know, revenge fantasies about killing him. Someone did you wrong. Jesus says, if you come to church, crawl over seven or eight people if necessary, and go get it right. Don't delay. So who is there in your life? Maybe you need to type an email, send a text, write a letter, call them on the phone, see them in person. Listen to the Holy Spirit. If you've committed your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit prompts you what you should do. Maybe you need to give your life to Christ. I'm telling you, without His help inside of you, I don't think you'll be able to do this. Maybe you've given your life to Christ and you say, I don't know. I don't know if I can forgive what that person did to me. I just don't think I can do it. Well, you know, you're probably right. But that's the whole message we bring. We come to Christ and say, I'm poor in spirit. I can't do this. I need you to help me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your words to us. You care about our relationships and anger issues that are tearing us up inside. And we all have them or have had them. Help us to deal with it today. I want you to talk to God right now. Every head bowed. Tell him maybe you've got somebody, a broken relationship, and you want to get it right. Tell him you want to do that and you need his help. If you've never committed your life to Christ, you can invite him right now to come into your life. You pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your amazing teaching and uh, help us with your help to deal with anger that might be inside of us and broken relationships that need to be repaired. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.